It is a great honor to speak to such a large audience and to present the book in Oxford. So thank you for that opportunity. So let me introduce myself briefly. I'm a senior research fellow at the Institute of Social Sciences in Zagreb and a full professor in the Department of History, University of Zagreb. I'm specialized in the social history of maps, cross-culture, knowledge exchange, and early modern encounter. I established first courses in map history in Croatia at Zagreb University, and hopefully contributed to the cartographic education of generation of students of history in the last 25 years. Basically, I teach history students how to read and understand maps as a historical source. In my recent research work, I focus on Jesuit cartography and missionary contribution to the exploration and mapping of the new world in general. And you ask me how my fascination with Jesuits started. I was intrigued by the fact that many of them actually came from Central Europe, Croatia including, and they worked in Americas unnoticed under the foreign name or even completely fictional names. Namely, due to the Spanish policy, only Spanish missionary could be sent to the New World. Only when the shortage of missionary in the mid 17th century uh, became damaging, in 1662, Spain changed its policy, permitting uh, only one third of the missionaries could, could be recruited from non Spanish countries. However, we know for the fact that much more than one third was recruited from non Spanish countries. And they they tried to hide that fact, of course, because they would broke the world law. So they changed their names. Sometimes, in most cases, they just translated their names in Spanish, or sometimes they completely changed their names. So you cannot tell nothing about their real identities. So, for example, Eusebio Kino, one of the most famous Jesuit map maker, traveled to America under the false name as Eusebio Chavez, native of Cordoba. And one of the most famous Croatian Jesuit map maker, Ferdinand, Ferdinand Konšćak, is much better known as Fernando Consago, and it was often considered as a Spaniard. So when I started to fall out their real identities, the whole new world revealed to me, so I was sure that is something very interesting for cartography. Thank you, that sounds uh, very Jesuitical, that whole process there. So Jesuit contributions to, to science and particularly uh, in, in the context of our seminar here to geography, maps and cartography, uh, those contributions have attracted considerable interest over, over a considerable period, really. I'm thinking of uh, Brian Harley's um, writings on Jes Jesuit maps back in 1991. So can you tell us why you embarked on this study of Jesuit cartography, apart from tracking down and um, unmasking your, your compatriots contribution there. What was the wider picture? Well, interest in Jesuits, uh, in Jesuit cartography actually started to grow in early 20th century, when the first exhibition on Jesuit maps was organized in the Vatican Gardens in 1925. It was the first time the Jesuit maps were presented to general audience as a thematic exhibition. Something is happening. Okay, so that was the first step that gained a certain attention to that kind of Jesuit activity, which is quite secular and quite uh, untypical. Interest in Jesuit cartography after that initial exhibition, however, stayed limited to the Jesuit scholars. So most of the people who wrote about the Jesuit maps were Jesuit scholars like Guilherme Furlong from uh, Argentina, Seratim Leche from Brazil, or Jean de Langlaise and Ernest Boros in the Un United States, to name only some of them. The real turning point was marked by two scholars related to Wisconsin medicine. First of them is less known, it's Stephen Harris, whose PhD, Jesuit Ideology and Jesuit Science from 1988, was forced to frame Jesuit geographic knowledge as an important topic to understand the global early modern history. The other is much better known, you mentioned him, it's Brian Harley, 
with his emblematic work, Map as a Mission, published in 1991, that laid the foundation for further study of Jesuit maps in the context of persuasive cartography. When I got involved about 15 years ago, there was still no syn synthesis on, Je on Jesuit cartography. There was a large number of papers on one map or one cartographer or one region, but there was no it was not conclusive, there was no synthesis. So that was my, um, my contribution. My idea was to compare the Jesuit maps produced between Spanish, Portuguese and the French empire to see how these cartographies appeared, how they evolved and interfered. Thus, I was not interested in individual maps that much, but rather how they interconnected, how they influenced each other. And I was particularly interested in something that Matthew Adney would call 3P, the places, purposes, and people. I call the same things where, why, and who. So where the maps appears, who are the map makers, and why they been produced, and how they circulate. So that was my approach to this study. Thank you. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us uh, a little about how the global reach of the, of the Jesuit order affected their mapping. So we have to understand the Society of Jesus in the context of early modern globalization. That's crucial for understanding the Jesuits and they were in map making. We, uh, they are established in 5040 during the Counter-Reformation. We all know that because we learned the school. But somehow we like to forget they're also established in the age of exploration and colonial expansion. And that exact fact made them a major stakeholder in the history of exploration and mapping. So they've been on the right place in the right moment. And their strong commitment to evangelization enabled them to establish the first global network of Jesuit missions worldwide and Society of Jesus is actually considered as the first uh, corporation of early modern era. So although they've been preceded by other orders due to the strong support they have from the, uh, they have from the church and from the king, they soon became absolutely predominant. So they started to spread their missions first in Asia, in Goa in, 50, uh, in uh, 5042, then they uh, continue with Africa, and only then they arrived in America. So America was actually a third step of their missionization effort. First Jesuit missionaries in America appeared in Brazil in 1549. Uh, 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 then the first missionaries appeared in the Spanish Empire in Florida in 1566, and then in the French Empire since 1609. So the America was actually the last step, but America appeared to be their greatest success, not only in the term of missionization, but particularly in the terms of history of exploration and mapping. There is no place in the world in which Jesuits produce more map than in America. Uh, a previous slide, please. So this is a very, a uh, strong image, strong map produced by Heinrich Scherer, also a Jesuit who is better known as a teacher of Eusebio Kino. This world map is produced in 1703 in polar projection. It makes a strong statement about the global nature of the Society of Jesus because it shows a spatial distribution of the Jesuit missions worldwide. So it highlights their globality and connectivity. Of course, it is also accompanied by a very strong iconography, strong images. So you can see on the lower angles of the map, the image of Ignacio Loyola in, and Francis Xavier is a co-founder of the Society of Jesus. And in the upper part of the map, you can notice the images of Jose Anchieta and Andre Oviedo, Oviedo representing South America and Africa. So it was a strong image and the polar projection emphasized their globality. So how they, this map 
shows very well how they function and how they communicate their knowledge. Thank you. Um, and I wonder if you uh, could identify what there was specifically about the Jesuit religious mission and its purposes and its personnel, which led to their astonishing contribution to cartography. And perhaps to put that in, in, in context, did any other religious missionary orders produce any comparable cartographic contributions or perhaps any maps at all? Yes, as I already mentioned, members of other orders preceded Jesuits in the New World, and they, they also produced some maps. For example, Franciscans and Dominicans were sent to America already in uh, 1493, and Recollets also preceded, uh, preceded Jesuits, and they all produce a certain number of maps. Yet after Jesuit arrived, they soon outstripped of others or all others. And there is a certain circumstances that uh, contributed to their success as a cartographers. First of all, it's their centralized structure. So they've been organized almost like a military organization because Ignacio Loyola was a military person because uh, before he became a missionary. So they have a centralized structure with audiencias and provinces, with cities and as educational centers and missions as a provincial outpost. So they have very strict hierarchy vertically and horizontally. The second issue about Jesuits is their obligation to regular reports to their superiors. And that fact particularly contributed to their corporative culture. They share and collaborate as a standard procedure, which is not very often the case in that time. And there is also an issue of their ethnic diversity that make them very receptive for other culture. Don't forget that many of the Jesuit missionaries were actually Creoles, so they worked in their domestic culture. Another issue typical for Jesuits and not for some other uh, religious orders is their publishing services, which is which was amazing. They start to publish their reports, sometimes accompanied also by maps, already in the 16th century. They started with so-called litera annua in the late 16th century, which were disseminated worldwide. Then they continue by the French edition of Relation. And then in 18th century, there is more and more serious publication like a German edition, the Neue Weltbot, that published all, all uh, reports from all empires, and then the French edition edited letters. Of course, this is English translation. So they disseminated the knowledge worldwide, but I have to say with a different result because each of those empires have a different policy in regard of the secrecy of geographic information. So the French empire was the most general, generous. So they published mostly all the Jesuit reports and maps. Spain was more, more cautious, so they did publish some reports and maps, but not that many. And in the contrast to Portugal, which published almost none. So there is a very different uh, approach to dissemination of Jesuit knowledge. Another specific issue about the Jesuits, it's their obligation to teach. Since 5060, all Jesuits had to teach. So they established educational presence at every level. So they've been teacher of the kings, of the nobility, of the Creole elites, but also of ordinary people. So they really, uh, they've been influenced. They had opportunity to influence the people with their knowledge. And last but not least is that their academic excellence in science and humanities. According to Ratio Studiorum, that is the basic documents of Jesuit education, besides natural history and languages, they've been taught various things very useful for cartography, like engineering, agriculture, hydrography, technical drawing, history of exploration, how to use maps, not to mention that many of the Jesuits before they've been sent to America spent some time in Casa de Contratación in Seville when it comes to Spanish Jesuits or Casa de India when it comes to Portuguese Jesuits. So they've been very well prepared for their task 
of explorer and cartographers in the new world. Thank you. So it's that sort of combination of uh, uh, globalization, exploration, printing, the Counter-Reformation and the, the specific Jesuit um, mission that, 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 that makes this, this extraordinary contribution. Um, so if we could turn to, to the new world in particular, so the subject of your, your excellent book, um, the Americas were the object of interest for trade, settlement, conquest, exploitation, Christianization um, of various European powers by the time the Jesuit order began its work there. And you write about the order's activities in the territories claimed by the empires that you've just mentioned, the, the Spanish, the Portuguese and the French. Uh, can you tell us what the Jesuit uh, cartographers and priests in general were in the lands of e each of these powers and how that um, affected the cartography? Yes, uh, the, the place of Jesuit, Jesuits in cartography of America is very specific. Uh, there is no comparison in other parts of the world. Uh, namely, after the initial exploration and territorial appropriation uh, was done, the first map appeared and they've been mostly produced by the royal authorities of chartered companies and they outline the continent. So you can see the map on the left, that is the map of Sebastian Münster that was published in his Cosmographia that show you that early stage. That is result of the royal uh, exploration and exploration done by mostly by the chartered companies. So that is the early stage in which only outline of the continents was known. Everything that lies in the interior reminded still unknown. On the right, you can see completely different map. This is the map that comes from the mid 19th century, that uh, 18th century that appeared just before the Treaty of Madrid. It shows Brazil and it's almost topographic map. So my question that I asked myself during my research, how, how we actually came from this first stage presented with the map on the left to the stage that is presented on the, with the map on the right. And I, I argue actually that regional mapping by Jesuits played a crucial role. The Jesuits were the one who been set off into interior to explore and map unknown in order to set up the missions and of course to establish colonial order there. Jesuits were the reliable agents who explored the interior and exchanged knowledge with the indigenous people they met. Thanks to their firsthand knowledge and knowledge they gained from the native nations, they compiled first regional maps in the 17th century, all three empires heavily relied on the Jesuit mapping of the interior. Only in the 18th centuries, proper state and colonial cartography took over, and that is the result that we can see on the map on the right. So Jesuits produce, of course, very diverse map. So if, if we take a, a, a next slide, we will see that their production, production is not limited to ecclesiastic maps that shows missions within province, uh, as many people think. Their maps vary by content and the purpose. So each empire created a different environment for mapping. Their work depended heavily on both on imperial policy and the local historical context. So the map you can see on the left, is the map of Sonora uh, produced by Adam Gilg, Moravian Jesuit in 1692. It's something that someone could think as a typical missionary map because it shows the uh, Jesuit province with position of the missions. But you can also notice that a lot of attention is paid to presentation of the uh, physical, physical geography. So there is a lot of exploration that was done by Adam Gilt that is presented on this map. For example, the uh, Tiburon Island in, that you can see in front of the uh, Sonoran coast is almost the first time presented on this map. 
So it's not just a mission presented on the map. And of course, it's very interesting to see his vision of the indigenous group of people. He met the Seri people. Look at of this a graphic that represents the local people. They are not presented as hunters or as warriors, but as a family. So they presented the Seri people as a people who value family life. It's a discourse of Jesuit we often forget. So this is one type of map they produce. However, on the right, you can see one very different Jesuit map. It's map of Bahia de la Paz. It's a part of the uh, Baja California. It was produced in 1737 by Croatian Jesuit Ferdinand Konšća. And if you take a closer look, you will notice there is no missions on that map. There is no symbols of the Jesuits. It's a, actually a proper topographic map which shows soundings of Bahia de la Paz and configuration of the terrain in very, uh, very much military fashion. So this is also map produced by Jesuit. And if we can take another slide, there is two other um, um, examples how untypical or unexpected the Jesuit cartography is actually. On the left, you can see one French Jesuit map. It shows Lake Superior and part of the Michigan Lake and the Huron Lake. It was a result of the exploration by Marquette, Aloe, and Claude Dablon. It was compiled in 1671. It was published two years later. This is the printed edition of their map. So you will notice it's actually a hydrographic map that shows a new exploration of the Great Lakes. So map actually focus on hydrography. There is no, again, symbols of Society of Jesus. You can see on the upper part of the map a coat of arms of the French king, but Jesuits are not even mentioned. Along the edge of the lake, you can see some missions, but without crosses, without churches. The presentation of the missions is very discreet because this map actually deal with hydrography and the trade routes. And on the right, again, very one very different map. This is the Portuguese Jesuit map that shows Colonia de Sacramento. It was uh, drafted by Diogo Soares in 1731, just after the colony de Sacramento was handed over to Portuguese. So when you take a look at that map, you can see it's basically, again, a military map. It shows a fortified town. May Jesuits are not mentioned at all. There is no Jesuit symbols, not Catholic symbols at all. So it's a clearly military map. What I wanted to say, they produce very different types of maps uh, depending on the imperial policy and the needs of the local community. That's very interesting. Thank you. And um, amidst all that variety of presentation and purpose and so on, can you identify then any distinctive visual qualities of a Jesuit map or is that not, not a quest worth pursuing? Yeah, it's a very important issue. So does missionary cartography or Jesuit cartography make a distinctive genre? That's something I question myself because I noticed they produce large number of very different maps and reports that strongly influenced Western vision of the world. They've been driven by practical needs of the missionaries, but also by their religious persuasion, but also by colonial administration, the needs of colonial administration. So they've been agents of both the empire and the church. And in that context, we of course have to ask a question, is a Jesuit cartography just part of colonial cartography? Yes, there is a lot of overlapping in that, but we will see there is a certain issues, certain aspects of Jesuit maps that are not present on colonial map. Of course, there is another issue, Jesuit cartography is based on the first-hand knowledge, but not only that, they also involved indigenous knowledge in their maps. So their maps are a result of cross-cultural exchange. And in that con uh, context, we also could ask a question, is a Jesuit cartography part of exploratory cartography? 
yes, they also overlap, but again, there is some distinctive features. So what makes Jesuit cartography really distinctive? First, it is their religious motivation, which is not present on other type of maps. It is topology of information presented. So they are more interested in a network of, of information than the single information by itself. And of course, there is a distinctive iconography, which is present on their map. As much as they are diverse, missionary maps are unified by the iconography and strong religious motivation. And you can see clearly uh, that from this map of Pimeria produced by Francesco Eusebio Chino in very late 17th century. The purpose of Jesuit map is always to maintain a positive public image of continuous success of society of Jesus, but also of colonial power. So there are no doubt they're part of persuasive cartography, which is intended primarily to influence beliefs and opinions. An iconography of Jesuit maps is expressed to several levels. The content of the map, which is spoken, which is not spoken, the symbol they use, so they use churches, crosses, and so on. The cartouches and illustration, which are very powerful. So this map of Pimeria Alta, uh, compiled by Eusebio Kino, is a good example about the Jesuit iconography. Uh, look at the center of the map. It shows the martyrdom of uh, Francisco Xavier Saeta, the, the Jesuit father uh, who was killed by the indigenous people in Pimeria Alta. And Eusebio Kino drew that map to enclose the map to the biography of the martyred colleague. It highlights their sacrifice for colonial power and for their religious beliefs but it also shows indigenous landscape in its full extent. So he didn't note on, the, on his map only Jesuit mi missions. He also included all the native villages. You can see it on the northern side of the map along the Gila River. There is a lot of native villages. So unbaptized people are also presented. So the native cultural landscape is fully presented. And all the red inscriptions you can see on the map, these are the names of the local nations he met or heard of. So this is something that is typical for Jesuit cartography, but not necessary for colonial or explorative cartography of uh, that uh, part of the world. And the next slide, please which is also very important to make a difference and to understand Jesuit maps, to make clear difference between the autograph Jesuit maps and their printed, mean heavily edited versions. So here you can see the example of one map, which is autograph map. On the left, you can see the map of Baja California uh, drafted by Ferdinand Korshak in 1746. And on the right, it's an edited version of the same map prepared for Venegas Buriel book, Notizia della California. And you will notice a huge difference. Uh, on the left, it's a clear, clearly physically geographical map. Of course, it includes missions, but the purpose of this particular map was to, sh to prove peninsularity of Baja California. And that particular map was sent to the Spanish king and only after that, the Spanish king made a formal uh, official statement about Baja California as a peninsula. So that was the purpose of the map. So you can see there is no strong symbols of the map. The Society of Jesus you just mentioned, but it's basically map focused on physical, uh, physical geography. On the right, you can see completely different image. It's a full of strong images Westernite perception of the native nations. You, on the bottom of the map, you can see uh, tragic images of the martyrdom of the Jesuit fathers. So it's completely different message. But that message is not a result of Ferdinand Korczak vision of Baja, but of the vision of the editor who prepared the map. So there is a very distinctive uh, difference between autograph map drawn by Jesuits on the missions 
and the edited printed edition that were heavily edited and they send a different kind of messages. Thank you. And that um, very interesting point about the, the process by which um, maps come uh, to our attention uh, is really critical, I think, and leads us on to Matthew Edney's insistence that we should look, focus on the process of, of, of map making. And in that context, I wonder if you could say a little more about the process by which the Jesuits produced their maps in the New World and tell us perhaps how distinctive that was or wasn't, and whether the process was, was mirrored elsewhere. Uh, Jesuit maps had several purposes, and that is important to understand. One of them was practical purpose. Uh, also, they use maps to attach to their report on evangelization. And of course, there was a colonial purpose of showing territorial and intellectual appropriation of the space. In most maps, the secular content is, however, dominant. So that is something unexpected for the Jesuit maps, because each empire creates a different environment for mapping, and they work dependent on the, as I said, imperial policy, but also on the local context. So the strongest impact on Jesuit can be noticed in the Spanish empire, where they were crucial for religious issues, but also in a secular affairs. In the Portuguese empire, Jesuit presence was strong, but Jesuits were used as a supplement for the state and military mapping. So they've been involved in demarcation, in military affairs, in fortifying, in mining activities. This mapping by the Portuguese Jesuits were predominantly secular. The same can be said for French empire, which was run by the chartered companies for a very long time. So most of the French Jesuit maps are first to exploration and economic and military issues, or better to say to trade issues. So their approach to mapping was very diverse. It was dependent on the, on the need and of the imperial policy. And, um... I can, can see that the purpose is, is, is critical in, decide, in in establishing the process, but I, I'm, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about, at the, about that process, how, so how we got from the, the exploratory activity through to the actual drawing of the maps, and then you've mentioned sending them home, but uh, can you tell us a little more about that actual process of producing them? So the uh, techniques they applied was actually very similar to, techni to techniques applied by any other cartographers of their time. So they've been up to date with technology, I would say. So the good equipment was of the essence. They all have a compass equipped with, with gnomon, so it could be used as a sundial. They usually have astrolab, not necessary, but usually sometimes even a quadrant, a telescope, and of course, navigational handbook with tables of longitude and latitude. The most popular, especially in the early 18th century, was the uh, Heinrich Scherer Geographia Artificialis. It is a manual that explains how to use instruments, and it also contains a large table of the places with the longitude and latitude. So they use that table very often. They would find the closest place to their place with the defined uh, coordinates. And they that, was, that would be the starting point of their calculation based on the distances. In order to compile a map, Jesuit usually use existing maps as a starting point to, stage, uh, to sketch the skeleton of the map a GERD. Uh, that was the mathematical base in which they would enter data from their own observation and the knowledge they gained from the uh, native people they met. How they collected geographical data, as I said, part of the, part of the uh, knowledge came from their own observation and sometimes also measurements, but communication with indigenous people were also crucial. So their maps are always 
uh, expression of cross-cultural exchange. And of course, they use other maps as a source of information if they were available. When it comes to latitude, they mostly use dead recording. Only sometimes the astrolab was used. For example, we know for the fact that Kino used astrolab to check the latitude. Distances were calculated based on the travel time, and of course, they struggled the most with the longitude. Only sometimes method of time eclipses was used. The longitude was, as a rule, a der derivated number. So that, that is the reason why many of the Jesuit maps doesn't have a longitude grid, only a latitude, because it was also very difficult for them as well as for other cartographers, their contemporaries. Due to the high effective dissemination of their, uh, of their work and the network they have worldwide, Jesuit knowledge was clearly mirrored in European cartographies. Numerous commercial maps was based on the Jesuit data, even that those maps that were not produced by Jesuit uh, cartographers. Thank you. And uh, you've touched on um, something I'd like to move on to now, but, which is the relationship between the order and the secular authorities in the Americas. And uh, certainly in, in British imperial discourse, the imperial work of missionaries and secular authorities is often written about as if missionary activity is effectively an arm of government. That is that church and secular authorities have aims which are closely aligned and wholly compatible. And indeed, Harley back in 1991 uh, suggested that Jesuit maps simultaneously showed secular and religious power. So I wonder if you could uh, comment on this alignment or misalignment of sacred and secular authorities in the areas that you consider. Yes, as I said before, there is uh... The, the secular content, uh, content is actually predominant in most of the Jesuit maps because they served uh, a colonial power as well. So they had to react and produce maps that were needed in a certain moment and a certain place. So they've been very flexible and they produce so various types of maps. They've been in, involved in drainage works. So they would produce some hydrographic maps that deals with the uh, uh, regulation of the waters around the Mexico City, or they would produce some navigational map of Florida Keys when it was needed. So they've been very flexible. And if we ignore the, the, the fact that the map include missions itself, most of other context is actually clearly secular because their maps were used in a various uh, state affairs, missionary, uh, military affairs, and many other affairs. So they've been very flexible and they've been involved in everything, especially in the Portuguese um, empire when there was a chronicle lack of other cartographers. It was less case in, this, uh, in the New France, but in Portuguese empire and Spanish empire, the Jesuits were really crucial for all secular, secular affairs as well. Thank you. Um, to, to bring us now to something else which we've touched upon, but I think it'd be really useful to uh, hear your, your more uh, considered comments. And that is, um, of course, that the lands that we've been discussing weren't empty, but obviously the pre-existing home to numerous peoples with their own accumulated geographical knowledge, their own modes of representation, their own ways of transmitting that knowledge. Did this indigenous knowledge find its way onto the Jesuit maps and, and was it modified in the process? And, and if so, how? The Jesuit knowledge was crucial for Jesuit mapping. Indigenous people were not just the guides to Jesuits, they shared geographical knowledge and sometimes drew contact directly into the Jesuit maps, which makes them, as I said, cross-culture exchange. Mm. In this exchange, a certain issues, of course, appeared that refers to the different notion of time, which is for us linear, for indigenous people, not necessarily linear, mostly unlinear, and they have a different notion for space, which we 
see a quite clear mathematically based and indigenous culture not. So yet their knowledge is clearly woven in all Jesuit maps. So if you take a look of this slide, you can see a two early Jesuit maps. One is the Spanish, the second is a French, but all maps make my point. So on the left, you can see a map of the Mohos region. It's today Bolivia. That is the map from the mid 17th century. It shows geographical information in the forms of textuality. So you can see a lot of text inserted into the map because that information came from the native people as a description and they didn't know how to put it on the map. So they put description as a text and that is the clearly evidence of the native knowledge. And of course, there is an indigenous place names they recorded. So this map of Mohos is full of uh, uh, indigenous place names that later disappear. The similar features can be noticed on the French map on Huronia that you can see on the right. This is map produced by Jean de Brebeau in 1631. But this map even went to one step further it is compiled in indigenous language. So not they ma only the ma they mapped all the indigenous villages, but they named the, uh, the Jesuit missions by indigenous names. So the whole map is compiled on indigenous language. And that is very often and typical in French Jesuit maps, even in the 18th century. The idea of indigenous language appears even in some 19th century maps of United States, which very interesting um, a phenomenon that some Jesuit who mapped Montana or Idaho in the mid 19th century mapped the region in the native language, but what they did. So Jesuit had been very persistent in presentation of indigenous knowledge and culture on their maps. That's very interesting indeed. Thank you. Um, I wonder what the effect was of the 18th century suppression of the Jesuits on their cartography and that of others. I mean, you mentioned the Montana map, so obviously it didn't come to the end with the suppression, but but it must have must have affected things enormously. Yes, the post-suppression cartography is very specific. I always saying that uh, there is more than one suppression, so there is a plural because Jesuit suppression didn't appear on all the empires at the same time. The Portugal was first in 1759, then the France in 1764, and only then the Jesuits were suppressed from the Spanish Empire in 1767. And it came with different consequences, very different consequences. The worst fate befell the Portuguese Jesuits who were all expelled, but many of them were imprisoned in Portugal, not for years, but for decades. Only a few of them managed to leave Portugal and find their shelter in papal states, but they didn't produce any map in the post suppression period. The French Jesuits were banned, but allowed to stay in France and the French dominions. So there was no prosecution for them, yet they did not produce any maps as it was only a few of them stayed in New France in the time of suppression because most of the Jesuits in New France were being disfavored much before the suppression. And the third case is with the Spanish Jesuits. The Spanish Jesuits were expelled from America and they all find the exile in Italian states where they continue to work with su financial support of the Spanish king, which is a very interesting idea. Namely, the Spain saw potential in the former missionaries, and they paid them to publish their accounts and maps in the post-suppression period to speak affirmatively, affirmatively about the Spanish empire. Of course, in such a context, their maps were marked by very strong censorship, even self-censorship. So post-suppression Jesuit maps are all Spanish and they completely omit symbols of the Society of Jesus because they cease to, to exist. Their former missions are now presented neutrally only as the villages. There is no crosses, there is no churches, there is no martyrdoms. 
authors are signed as a monks or preachers, something again very neutrally. Only the German states were most re, more, more re, liberal in that regard. So some post-suppression Jesuit maps published in Germany kept some of the Jesuit symbols, but it is really exception. Mm -hmm. And which is very interesting. Interesting, there is a certain difference in the discourse in post-suppression maps by Creoles and non-Creoles, because the Creoles missionary were uh, being expelled as well from their homes. So, and they lost not only uh, they lost not only emissions but also their homeland. So, in their maps, they show more nostalgia and more interest in the indigenous identity. That's very interesting indeed. Thank you. Um, perhaps on a lighter hearted note, could, could you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the more surprising maps that you um, encountered during your work on the book? Um, for those who weren't um, with us for our chat before we came on air, uh, Mirella was saying um, how, the, how her research for the book had taken her, I think, to more than in 50 archives, or she was in contact with more than, than, than 50 archives in 50 different countries. So um, an astonishingly rich um, archival basis for the book. And I wondered, uh, on the base of that, if you could tell us some of the more surprising maps you encountered. Well, I will show you only two examples which are not expected for me. The first example is this that you can see on the slide. These are two maps of Patagonia that are a result of the same Jesuit maritime expedition that took place in 1745 and 46. And it was they were produced by two different Jesuit missionaries with very different personal background. The first map on the left is map produced by Jose Quiroga, and it's a, clearly a navigational map. So he saw only the coastline and the name of the capes. He left the whole Patagonia as an empty space. Why? Because in previous life, he was a mariner. He spent most of his life on the boat, and he was, of course, interested only in navigational issues. So he was not interested in human geography at all. So for him, the Patagonia was completely empty space. In the contrast, his colleague, Jose Cardiel, he was very experienced missionary with more than 30 years experience in modern day Argentina. So of course, he didn't see Patagonia as an empty space, but densely populated and rich in culture. So he, based on the same exploration, he produced anthropological map of Patagonia, which shows the indigenous group of people based on how they live, whether they uh, use horses or travel by foot, or they use uh, agriculture in their everyday life. So his vision of the same place was completely different. So that, that is example, how you can see the same place during the same trip, but with completely different eyes. So those two maps are not confronting, they are actually complementary. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the next uh, example I wanted to show with you is this map of the Mexico, or better to say of Sonora, Sinaloa, and Tarahumara, which looks very nice. And it looks like a rather typical missionary map that shows the Jesuit provinces and the position of the missions. But when I start to analyze the content of the map, it's nothing like it. If we can get to the next stage of this map, please one click. Okay. This is the reconstruction of the content of the map. And you can notice, of course, the missions are presented, but also all the presidios are represented. But what map really focused on is a mining seat. So the question is why the Jesuits would map a mining seat of Sonora. This is the northern Spanish borderland. And the problem was that many of the military officers who supposed to sit in Presidio and watch the borderland, they left their position to join the mining business, that, which was very lucrative. And that put in danger the whole borderland, including the Jesuit missions. And that's why Jesuits of Sonora started to pay attention and put the mining seats of their map. And after this particular map was sent to the 
Spanish authority, the military inspection took place and they completely reorganized the whole uh, northern Spanish uh, borderland, only thanks to this map, among other things. So these are two very unexpected cases. Uh, very nice examples, thank you. Um, so as we, we draw to a close, I wonder if you uh, could um, tell us what in your estimation was the main contribution of the Jesuit order to the processes of cultural ex exchange, knowledge, circulation um, in the period you've been, um, been studying and the areas you've been studying. Mm -hmm. The Jesuits were one of the major provider of geographical knowledge to Europe. So Jesuits were real influencer of the early modern era and their knowledge was empirical, thus highly respected and they fit well into the Enlightenment vision of the science, no matter what we think about the Enlightenment and Jesuits as the two opposite things, but they fit actually quite well. And since late 17th century, Jesuit had a special agreement with French Academy of Science. They provided them with their reports and maps, and in return, French academicians would communicate their exploration. That specially refers to the royal uh, cartographers in Paris, such as Sanson, Coronelli, Dalil, or particularly Danville. But not only French knowledge was communicated by the French Academy. In 18th century, Spain was directly linked to the most of uh, to France through the House of Bourbon. So French Academy communicated Spanish data as well. So some of the most most iconic map of America, and especially the New France was based on the Jesuit knowledge. So you have to know how to look, but they're really based on the Jesuit knowledge, although they've been produced as a part of commercial uh, non-Jesuit European cartography. Of course, it is important to highlight the fact that some Jesuit accounts and maps reach France as an autograph, which I explain why is the huge difference about that. And some they've been taken for the printed editions. So those printed were heavily edited and garnished with the strong images that I show you. So when you see the strong westernized stereotypical images of the new world you, that you can find in some cartouches of commercial maps in, produced in Europe, they're work of the editor, not of the Jesuit missionary in the field. So to conclude, the Jesuits been really an early modern influencer, as we call it today. Thank you. So that that is a very nice account of how that that knowledge comes from their empirical um, activities, but also, as you said, from from the their encounters with the indigenous people. So it's interesting to see that indigenous knowledge finding its way into to mainstream European culture there. So one final question before uh, we, we come to a close. Um, I wonder if you could tell us whether this book has spurred you on to further research. I should think, um, for those of you who don't know the book, I think it's something like 450 pages long. So I should think that having a rest might have been uh, your first priority when you finished it. But I wonder if you could tell us about how it may have influenced your, your future research plan. Yeah. Well, the book is very expiring because I found so many unexpected things in Jesuit maps. So I know I didn't stop in a moment. And we, as I said in, in the conclusion of the book, this book has no proper conclusion because every day we find new Jesuit maps of America that change. And each of those maps change a story a bit of what we know about Jesuit cartography and how that cartography was influenced by other uh, communities and other uh, cartography. So it's something that I it really needs a further attention. My current research uh, refers to Jesuit mapping in Middle East and India. These are the regions in which Jesuits lived in multicultural urban societies in which Catholic made a very small minority. In such case, it is particularly interesting to see how they deal with image of others how they presented others and otherness, and what perception of the human landscape 
was in general. For example, I found very interesting case of mid 17th century French map of Syria, which was then part of the Ottoman Empire. That provide interesting insight how they deal with ethnic and religious diversity. So it will be very interesting journey for me to compare the situation in Middle East where the Jesuits actually lived in the urban centers, which is with the Jesuits in America, which were mostly posted on the rural region in the interior. So I would like to compare their world, their visions, and especially the visions of others. Well, I'm sure I speak for um, our whole audience when I say that um, you're looking forward to, to the research for that book, and we're all very much looking forward to the results of that book. So if you haven't already uh, seen Mirella's book, then I can warmly recommend it and uh, do, do go and read it and uh, delve further into this uh, extraordinary and fascinating story of Jesuit cartography in the new world. Thank you so much, Mirella, and I'll hand you over now to Nick. Uh, so that our audience can um, uh, enjoy your answers to, the, to their question. Over to you, Nick, but thank you, Mirella. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, thank you, Mirella. That was absolutely wonderful. A, a great tour through Jesuit cartography there. And it's really encouraged the audience to be asking questions throughout. So I'd like to begin by going back towards the start of um, your discussion with Liz and the Shearer map from 1703. And one member of our audience asked the question, how would this map have been published? And once published, how did Jesuits communicate this knowledge with one another? Yes, um, when it comes to uh, Henry Scherer map, it was published in, in, in his Atlas, Atlas Novus, which was a multi-volume um, publication. Uh, most of the Jesuit maps were published within the Jesuits' accounts as a printed, meaning edited version of their autographs, so they are already changed uh, significantly. So most of the maps are within the books, within the Jesuit relations. Only few, only few Jesuits managed to publish their map as a loose sheets. There is also a case of, of that, but that was more exception. Most of the Jesuit maps were uh, published within the Jesuit relation, which is actually good because, of course, they are edited and changed, altered, but they've been widely disseminated across the world. So that was the positive side of the publication of the Jesuit maps within the Jesuit relation. So they reached the audience around the world. And that's that one of the facts that made, made them so influential when it comes to Jesuit knowledge. So that was the important things to have a effective publishing services without internet, without Facebook, with, without Twitter, Twitter. So they managed to inform the general audience worldwide about their experiences, about their knowledge and their exploration. So that was very, very difficult in early modern era. Thank you for that very comprehensive um, answer. I'm sure that answers our questioner um, absolutely perfectly. Now, moving on. We've been asked what cartographic training did Jesuits have? And once they were working on their maps, did they use other people to cover all the ground to actually map the interior of all these, which may have seemed like strange lands? Well, as I mentioned, the Ratio Studiorum, their concept of their education was quite comprehensive. So they've been very well prepared. They've been educated in languages, but also in natural sciences, but in many practical things, like I mentioned agriculture, technical drawings. They've been involved in the study of uh, uh, history of uh, exploration, and they study maps in Casa de Contratación and uh, Casa de India in Lisbon. So they've been very well prepared by 
not only by their missionary task, but also for the exploration and mapping. So we know, that, uh, and of course they study uh, cosmography and astronomy as well. They've been familiar with tr trigonometric, uh, with um, use of the tables, with calculation of the deviance in the magnetic north, how they use a compass and to correct the compass value with the magnetic north. So they've been very well prepared through their education. And it's very interesting to see that all the colleges, because as I said, their, their ethnic uh, origin is very diverse. Many of them were Creoles, but even Creoles educated in Latin America, for example, they're very well educated in natural sciences. So they know how to use maps and how to use astrolabe. Of course, it was also necessary for the survival. So they've been personally motivated to get to know all that techniques because it's a matter of life and death. S certainly puts an extra dimension onto things, doesn't it? Um, how fascinating. Uh, whoever would have imagined cartography to be such a Shall, how should we say a life-saving profession and activity so um, that's very reassuring to know another question uh, did the jesuits exchange information with other religious orders and were the maps produced by the jesuits used by reigning monarchies to defend their borders uh yes that they, they did use only for uh, for that as well the Jesuits did exchange knowledge with other orders, but very cautiously. They mostly change, exchange the knowledge with colleagues, the member of the same orders, which is also very important, but they didn't share only with, uh, with their superiors. So each Jesuit map would be sent to the Viceroy, to the superior of, of the province and to the Rome, and of course to the king. But which is very important, the Jesuits also shared the knowledge between them. So we know for the fact that one uh, Jesuit missionary would start some exploration and then the, the, ex, uh, the, the data would be sent to his colleague in the neighboring province and he would eventually continue that expedition that's, that was started by someone else. So that is very important because that enabled continuity interact because they shared as i said they say they shared and collaborated on the regular basis so that is very important but of course they've been much cautious with the members of other others especially with franciscans because they have a lot of demarcation problem with franciscans they very often fight over the jurisdiction on a certain region, for example, in Mexico, and particularly in 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 a lower uh, Mississippi, when they fight with a uh, several different orders, so it wasn't always ideal. It was also a fight because, as I said, the Jesuit cartography is also cartography of appropriation of the space. Thank you. That leads me on to something else, really. Uh, you've mentioned throughout your discussion with Liz, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French um, Jesuits. Did each of these nations have their own unique style, cartographic style? Could you say anything about that? Yes, uh, I try to, sh to give you some brief idea how Jesuit cartography is diverse. And it is again, cartography is in plural because the French, Portuguese and Spanish cartography show some particularities, which is not necessarily present on other imperial cartographies. So uh, the most typical is uh, Portuguese cartography, which, which is basically military cartography because they suffer from the lack of cartographers so they have they have done everything that in the normal circumstances would be done by military or the state cartographies, but they were non-existent in Brazil, especially in the 17th century. So Jesuits were involved in everything, particularly in demarcation issues, in the war affairs, 
when the Guarani war appeared in, in the in the Paraguay province, they've been highly engaged and they use maps to deal with diplomatic uh, solution for the Guarani war. Unfortunately, they didn't succeed, succeed, but we know they try to use maps to to make some compromise solutions between the Portuguese and the Spaniards, but it unfortunately didn't work. They've been first to, to map Amazon. And it was part again of one very unusual project because they been sent to, uh, to map Amazon after the Treaty of Madrid in 1750. But we all know that Amazon was not actually the border. So they've been sent to map the Amazon as a border between the Spanish, Spanish and Portuguese empire, but this Amazon is not the border. The, the border was much further north. So why? Because they want to have uh, information about the economic potential of the Amazon. That was the real purpose of this demarcation, which never was completed actually. So there was a lot of disguised purposes of Jesuit mapping. In the, uh, in the other hand, in the French Empire, it was a different situation because in the contrary to Portu Portugal, uh, Portuguese Empire, the French Empires, particularly in New France, they have a state cartographers as an official position introduced very early, already in 17th century. So France was not that dependent on the Jesuits because they also have a state cartographers. So the Jesuit would be sent to do some mapping when it was sensitive question that need communication with the local nations. And it mostly refers to the opening of the new trade, uh, trade um, uh, lines, because you know, for a very long time, the new France was run by the chartered companies. So it's all about the profit. So, as a result, Jesuits in New France produce a different kind of maps. They're dealing with economic potential again. And in the uh, Spanish Empire, they've been involved in some ecclesiastic uh, issues that we would expect to be involved. But they were they was also involved in, again, some territorial issues, economic issues, but not that much as it was the case in the Portugal. Portugal Jesuit cartography is the most strange cartography. And the fact they didn't publish any of the maps. So there is no Portuguese Jesuit maps that was printed ever because they keep it secret. That's interesting because a question we've just been asked from the audience is, um, were the Jesuits or the crowns of Portugal and Spain worried about their published maps providing information to political and religious enemies in Europe, especially the English and the Dutch, um, but also the French about the geography and resources of their American possessions, information that could be used to undermine Spanish and Portuguese control? Yes, of course, they've been very cautious about dissemination of knowledge. That's why I say that a different empires have a different secrecy policy. However, some maps always leaked and some maps were plundered from the ships. We know that for the fact. And of course, the British Empire, as well as the Dutch, they were not only dependent on the Jesuits because they have their own agents. There was also a, an Indian company established in Brazil. So they find their ways, not dependent on Jesuits to reach a certain geographical <clears throat> information. But of course the Jesuits were always interesting. But the, the interesting fact is that most of the relation that was published in Europe went to Europe to Antwerp. So Antwerp was the hub in which you could quote a certain uh, confidential information from the Jesuit relation. So Antwerp is, was very important for the circulation of Jesuit knowledge. That was the, the hub when all the spies came and tried to find something they don't know. Ah, how fascinating. Um, and it, it's wonderful how your answers take us straight on to the next question almost and this one is just coming you briefly mentioned commercial maps could you please 
explain what you mean by commercial mapping and how Jesuits were involved in it? Now, when I talk about commercial cartography, I'm mostly talking about the European cartography, uh, like French, like Dutch, like uh, German cartography, which were on the, which, these are the maps that are prepared for the market. So they were no secret mapping. That was maps that prepared for the larger audience and you could buy them. So that is the commercial cartography. And uh, you can find a direct trace of Jesuit geographical knowledge in these maps because of the French Academy of Science, because most of the influential cartographers had access to the uh, Paris uh, Library and archive, central archive, when all the Jesuits accounts and maps arrived, sometimes in, in, in manuscripts, sometimes as a printed edition. So that was another hub of the circulation of geographical knowledge. So even the maps that were not published, the content of the map, those maps were woven into the commercial map that find their way to market. So when you look at Nicolas Sanson map of uh, North America or his map of New France, you will find the fact that all the Jesuit knowledge is marked by the map. And we know for the fact that he used the Jesuit uh, relations because we found those relations and those maps in the French archive. And we know they have a direct communication. So they have correspondency with the Jesuits. So sometimes some cartographer like Coronelli or Sanson would draw the map and send the map to the Jesuit in America and say, please correct if something is not accurate. And then the map would travel back to Europe. So yes, they have direct correspondency with the Jesuits in Americas. That answer is again led on to the next question. It's almost as if you are uh, predicting what's going to come up next. So you mentioned persuasive cartography. How true is what was the Jesuits put on the maps? Did they give truthful information? And how do you know? Well, uh, uh, you have to analyze the map, but in the in the uh, considering the historical context only. That is the only way you understand the map properly. That's why I mentioned Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew Ennis 3P. You have to understand the context, who produced the map, why and where, to understand what to expect. And only when you know that, you can realize why some content on the map appears and why some other content don't appear. So that is very interesting. And of course, the Jesuit maps on the first side are always accurate. When it comes to physical geography, they will draw everything they know. But when it comes to human geography, that's different. Some, of course, some Jesuits had a different approach to that issue. And again, it depends on the historical moment. Some Jesuit would um, uh, include only the um, human geography that is related to Jesuits. So for example, uh, one of the very famous map of Orinoco River shows only Jesuit infrastructure. They show missions, they show uh, Jesuit colleges, Jesuit schools, uh, everything related to Jesuits. What is not related to Jesuits, it doesn't exist. However, most of the Jesuits were more fair and more objective, so they presented a very comprehensive uh, vision of the indigenous landscape, which we really respected. But of course, that economic interest that empire had or some chartered company had strongly influenced Jesuits' approach as well. So when Orinoco became important uh, economically, they start to map Orinoco with more, more attention to, to its economical potential and of course in regard also in regard of its military importance as a borderline so as i said it really import, uh, it was really influenced not only by the imperial policy but also of the local situation which influenced strongly uh, the purpose 
of their map. So if you consider why, uh, when, and who, you will probably understand quite clearly why the map has a contact with what is, that is presented on that particular map. Thank you, because you, you've mentioned the involvement with the indigenous population and the indigenous geography. Do we, is there any evidence out there to um, recognize that Jesuits may have consulted indigenous maps or don't these maps survive? I don't have direct evidence. I know that some indigenous people draw the content into the maps they've been offered to them. I don't have any direct evidence. They have some indigenous map and they copy it. No, not particularly in early modern era. We have a several or more than one examples in the 19th century, mm. but not in early modern era. So I know for, for several examples from 19th century, but I don't, I think that the, they probably existed, but I don't think, uh, the, I think that the point is that the indigenous map from early modern era simply not survived. That would be my answer. I, I assume they, they produce a certain maps because why shouldn't? Because they obviously possess the geographical knowledge. But I would say they, they simply didn't survive because we, we do have a copies of several indigenous maps from the 19th century. Thank you. And talking about encounters with the indigenous population, we've been asked how did the Jesuits communicate, especially at first, with the indigenous communities who presumably spoke a range of languages? Yes, they did. They've been extremely skillful in communication and in learning of foreign languages. So they've been um, a learn a new language in no time. So they've been famous on that because they've been, again, well prepared by their education. As they try really communicate with the local people, they would learn a language very fast. And as an evidence to that fact is the fact that the Jesuit missionary produced a large number of dictionaries with indigenous languages because they learn the language very fast. And as an illustration, when uh, uh, French uh, uh, exploration of Lower Mississippi started, the Jesuits were included and they helped exploration of the Lower Mississippi. But because of certain political and religious fight they have it, where, with the Jesuits, they've been removed. And I know that Iberville in his diary said, I need Jesuits, send me another Jesuits. I cannot continue to work on Mississippi exploration without Jesuits because those other missionaries, they don't speak any languages. So the, the speaking of the indigenous languages was the crucial for exploration and a good communication. And of course, uh, in establishing of a certain good relation with the local population in their culture. Thanks, that's very reassuring to hear. Now, we have time for just two more questions, which I already have lined up. So, do you know of any evidence of a hidden state agenda behind the Jesuit initiative to ask Padre Ovalle to return to Italy and produce his large and detailed map of Patagonia in 1646? Well, a story about uh, uh, Alonso Ovala is very complicated, but I will try to summarize it. Uh, it's very difficult to say what is all behind because there is a, a number of things that were behind of that map because that is one of the few examples in which Jesuit maps compile not only a Jesuit knowledge, but also Franciscan knowledge. So he was one of the few Jesuits who referring to Jesuits, uh, to Franciscan sources for his map, and that was noted on the map itself. So of course, there, there, there was uh, uh, an issue of territorial appropriation of the, of the Chile, because Chile is a very specific country. It is one of the few Spanish possessions which was never fully controlled. 
So there was a southern part of Chile, south of Bio Bio River, which, which gained autonomy uh, by Mapuche people. So no one could enter to south of Bio Bio except the Jesuits. So the Chile was very specific because it was a, a military institution because uh, the, the, it was a uh, lots of conflicts in that region. And that part of the world Spanish formerly possessed but never controlled. So that was one of the reasons of um, Ovale, uh, very, very iconic map of the Chile because it was matter of the control of the land you cannot control. The same issue was with Patagonia, which was formally controlled by Spanish, by Spanish Empire, but actually never controlled. That is the exact reason why they sent the maritime Jesuit maritime expedition along the Patagonian coast. So the Jesuit cartography is a lot about territorial and intellectual and intellectual conquest. So they've been part of colonial drive. We have to admit that. Thank you very much. And the final question is a, a very different one. In relation to studying these maps, um, our questioner would like to know, how do you view modern day GPS? Well, GPS is uh, a technical aspects of mapping and Jesuit had their GPS in their heads and I would say in their hearts. So the purpose is something that you cannot compare. So the purpose of Jesuit maps was completely different and they feel their purpose. The, Jesu uh, the GPS mapping is something completely different because it's, it is based on the mathematical accuracy. The Jesuit maps are nothing like that. So as I said, they didn't care that much about the mathematical basement of the map. They care about the topology of information presented. So it's a completely different view of mapping and it's a completely different purpose of mapping. Of course, we like to use GPS or better to say, we like to use georeferencing on a historical maps produced by Jesuits because we can learn a lot about by doing georeferencing their maps. It reveals a, a true story about how the maps were drafted. That is very useful, but I would say pretty much it. I wouldn't compare GPS mapping with, with the mapping of early modern era because the whole world of, of thinking about the space was completely different. Absolutely. Way to wrap up our session for this evening, Mirela. Thank you so much for all your time and your thoughtful answers. You've been talking non-stop now for an hour and a half, so I think it's about time that you uh, you had a rest. And uh, congratulations on a wonderful evening. So, on behalf of our audience, which was fully international, I would like to say thank you. Um, I would like to encourage those who enjoyed this evening's um, map readings that we next meet on the 4th of May, as Liz mentioned at the start of the evening. So I just wish you all a very pleasant evening or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And Mirela, this was an absolute pleasure. So I think now is the time to draw this to an end. I'd like to thank Stuart, our colleague behind the scenes, and Liz for asking all the questions and interviewing Mirela and Mirela, thank you so I just, much. Uh, I just wanted to draw your attention that some people raised the hand. I don't know, is it just a late reaction or something I miss? I just noticed that two people, including Mary Pedley, raised their hands. I don't know. I think we're not in a position to be able to get out of Zoom <laughs> webinar to respond. So um, if Mary has raised her hands, I'm sure Mary can uh, contact you uh, via email um, and ask you the question that she needs to. So, sorry, Mary. Um, thanks anyway. And we will now bring this meeting to a close. So it's lovely to have been able to host this and safe journey to wherever you're now proceeding. And Mirella, have a lovely evening. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you.